Flowering plants are the bedding plants of the indoor gardener. They're not really permanent. You can change the colour style of a room completely by changing the flowering plants. You can use the lighter colours to lift the shadows in a dark corner. Or you can paint ribbons and patterns along the front of the more permanent foliage plant. Strange how they give a vibrancy to a room. Immediately you introduce a new selection of plants into the room. And they don't take a lot of looking after. They need the regular watering because no use having an unhealthy plant in a room. They've got to have the sheen of good health on the leaves. They've got to look right, otherwise they might just as well be out on the compost heap. So feed them and water them. And the rewards are, are absolutely marvellous. St. Paulia's African violets are one of the most popular houseplants and I think deservedly so when you see the quality of the flower and the subtle colours that you get. But they're not easy to grow. You've got to give them exactly the right conditions of humidity and light and warmth. But there is a bonus to counteract that. They are very easy to propagate by leaf cuttings particularly. Don't take the outside leaves. Don't bother with those, because the more foliage you take from the middle, within reasonable limits, the more flower you're going to get. As you pull a leaf out, then you get flowers developing. And don't either, on the principle that those leaves are moribund anyway, take those for propagating material. You want good, healthy, disease-free foliage, like that one there. And when you take it away, Pull it out right at the base. Don't leave a stump of the whole leaf there at all. You can see that's absolutely clean back to the stem there. There's no sign of the whole leaf joint at all. With all house plants, if you're doing any pruning or taking cuttings, don't leave stubs. They rot back, they rot right back into the crown and you could lose the whole plant. There's a beauty. Young, vigorous, just coming up to mature leaf, with the stalk coming not from the base of the plant, but from round about the middle. And the leaf stalk doesn't want to be any longer than about three quarters of an inch. So break it off. Don't cut it. You don't need a sharp knife to cut it off with. Just break it like that. And that's ideal. Any longer, and you run the risk, really, of soft rot and the plant not rooting where you want it to. And the same way with the other one. Break it off to about three quarters of an inch. And if I'm in any doubt about the compost, with any cutting that I'm taking, I use a mixture of equal parts peat and sand. It's funny, most cuttings seem to accept and root in that with comparative ease. And the quicker you get the leaf cuttings into the compost, the better. Make a hole with your finger, not too deep, remember, because there's only three quarters of an inch of stalk, and you don't want to hang the cutting halfway up the hole. And you put them in back to back. This is a commercial trick, mainly to get as many leaf cuttings into the smallest possible space, but the ideal conditions are there for rooting because each leaf has the maximum amount of light and there's room for air space between the particular cuttings because even though St. Paulias need warmth and humidity, they don't want dankness, they don't want deadness, otherwise you get fungus disease. But put these in a temperature ideally of 72 degrees Fahrenheit, it's the right sort of warmth, and you want humidity, and you can put them inside a polythene bag, provided it has holes in the side. And then at intervals during the rooting period, you take the bag off and dry it off. So you don't get the clammy moisture. You've got a, a, an airy moisture, for want of a better word, a buoyant moisture. And ideally, given a temperature of 72 degrees Fahrenheit, Within 10 to 12 weeks, you should have good, strong, rooted plants with little plantlets growing from them, ready for potting off. And there's the old leaves. The parent leaves are still there, still looking as fresh as the day when I put them in, which is an additional reason for not using disease material. There you've got a real old cluster of plants. That's productivity, that. One leaf, and I can see two plants there. 
Anything more will be a bonus. But I'm not going to leave them like that. You couldn't leave them cloistered together like that. You've got to knock them out and pot them up. And don't tip the old compost. You can see how the mold has grown on the compost because you've provided the close, humid conditions that are perfect for rooting, which the St. Paulias love. Don't tip that onto your fresh compost. Very gently. Tap on the base of the pot like that. Get rid of the old rubbishly material. And gently, very, you can see the leaves there, very gently prise them apart. Now, in proportion to its size, the African violet doesn't make a great thumping root system. So I don't want to overpot. If you put them into too much compost, the roots can't use it all. It turns sour and the roots begin to rot off and they die back instead of going back just above the acid area. They continue to die back right into the crown of the plant and you lose the whole lot. So I underpot. I give them an extra stage. And even though I've got several individually well-formed plantlets there, I'm not going to take them off yet. I want them a bit bigger before I wean them. So put them into small pots. That way they can be right through the compost within a matter of, well, a couple of weeks. The roots are using that. And I'll only leave them in there for probably five or six weeks. And then I'll repot them and take the little plantlets off and pot those up again. And I might even be very greedy and re-root the parent leaves too. And when you've repotted like that, be very, very careful until you establish them in the new compost. Keep them particularly warm, particularly humid. Treasure them a little bit. And then, pretty quickly, you've got a plant like that. Now, that is a healthy young plant, I admit, but it's still a juvenile. It doesn't want to be messing about flowering, much as I like them. I want to build up the crown of the plant. I want a great, powerful piece of vegetation that's going to give me a heavy crop of flowers over a long period without sapping all the energy of the plant. So take the flowers off. Remember, as with the leaves, pull them right out at the base. No dead stalks left to set up a soft rot. Nip them off. Even though it seems like sacrilege, if you feel that way, you can apologize to the plant. Right off, clean by the stem. What a pity. But console yourself with the thought that you're doing the plant nothing but good. There it is. Reduced back to the job it should be doing, which is building up that crown. Now, keep encouraging that. African violet with warmth, with humidity, with feeding. Not in too big a pot again. This is enough to keep it going. I'm going to make it work for a living. And then if your growing conditions are right, you've got perfection, almost perfection, because the quality of the leaf, the sheen of health on the foliage, the great crop of flowers there. And how do you achieve that in the home once you've moved it out, where you want to see it in the place you're living in? Well, you give it good light conditions, but not direct sunlight. It wants to be diffused light. Good light, but not powerful sunlight that makes the leaves go grey. You've got to water it. And I make certain that I'm not using cold water, not straight from the tap by any manner of means. I draw a watering can of water from the water butt. I stand it in the same room as the African violet overnight. And then I plunge it in it the next morning. Because the one thing you don't want to do is get the crown of that plant wet. You want to water it from the bottom so the compost is evenly moist. And a lot of people, I've gone to many houses, you know, where they have the African violet standing in a bowl with water in the bottom. Now, you stand yourself in a bowl 24 hours of the day with your feet in water and very quickly you'd get sick. And the same thing applies to an African violet. If you're going to put it in a bowl, then put a layer of pebbles in the bottom, keep those moist, and that keeps moist air around the leaves and keeps the plant in a moist environment without being soggy wet. Keep the temperature, if you possibly can, around 65, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And that way you build up a healthy, glossy, bright plant. It looks good, it's growing well, it's flowering beautifully. But don't think that when that crop of flowers fades, that's it. Look after it, give it water, give it the right temperature. And there, down in that nest of leaves, you can see another crop of flowers, even bigger than the first lot. And if your plant is a wee bit sulky about flowering again, how do you persuade it to produce a second crop of bloom? Well, you can try 
changing the environment. Give it a change of room. Put it in the bathroom. Somewhere different. That might work. Check your cultivations. Make sure your temperature is right, your feeding is right, your watering is right. And then finally, as a last resort, I increase the potash in the feed. Give it a high potash feed. A lot of trouble, yes. But when you look at that plant, you appreciate why the St. Paula, the African violet, is one of the most popular of houseplants. Deservedly so. What a guest to welcome into your house. With calcellarias, if you've got a, a big room, then you use the big flowered hybrids like this. But in a small room, they tend to be just a wee bit overpowering. So I go for the smaller near species. The popular name of slipper flower just about does describe them mine, but they remind me very much of a laughing hippopotamus or a hippopotamus with mumps. They've got that shape of flower. You can either raise them from seed or you can, particularly with the big flowered hybrids, you can keep a stock plant, cut them back, and then take cuttings each year. With the smaller flowers, nearer the species, they will come true from seed, and rather than keep plants over the winter, I like to raise them from seed. And they're fairly easy to germinate, unlike some of the things we grow. And use a loam-based seed compost. Just enough in that to start them off. Firm it down and level it off. Make everything neat, because I find when you are neat in your methods of seed sowing, when you take care with the compost and make certain the top is level and you make certain the seeds are evenly spaced, then you get less problems with damping off and disease and things like that. Now, cancellaria seed is very fine very dust-like, so don't sneeze or it'll go right over the greenhouse and you'll have lost it. And if you're in doubt about whether you can sow fine seed thinly over the top of the compost, then mix it with a little bit of sand, and that'll get the spacing even. But it's comparatively easy with a little bit of practice to get it right, and take your time, don't rush it. Gardening should be a leisurely business. There. And then cover it with the finest whisper of compost or sand. Fine seed, if you cover them too deeply, they haven't sufficient food stored in the seed capsule to get above the compost surface. And you lose them and you wonder why they haven't germinated. And then gently firm it down. Just to marry the seed and the soil together. And there, you can see why the top of the compost has to be level, because now when I water, the water will sink in evenly and the whole of the compost will be evenly moist. I'll get no little hollows, no seed washing down into hollows, and they'll come up beautifully spaced. And what I do now is stand them where they're warm, cover them with a sheet of glass, a piece of newspaper, and within 10 days, depending on the temperature, they'll have germinated, and then you must take the glass and newspaper off, of course, to let the light come to them. And then, in six weeks or so, They'll have reached that stage, and they're ready for pricking out. They're just beginning to get a wee bit crowded in the pot. Now, here they were in seed compost, lawn burst seed compost, so I'm going to prick them off now, move them from a pot to a box, into John and his number one compost. It's got just a little bit more food in it to keep them going. What you want is balanced growth, and then you get a neat, compact plant. I'm never sure what's gone on underneath the compost until I lift them out and have a look. Oh, there's a fair old root system there. That's what you want. Top is really immaterial if it's got a powerhouse like that underneath. Five, about five across a box like that. And space them out. Keep your rows straight because it's so much nicer when you look down your greenhouse and you see everything nicely spaced out, plus the fact that if you get your spacing even, each plant has its fair share of light, food, water, and in a lot of cases, air, because if you've got a good circulation of air through them, your risk of disease, of damping off and everything else is so much less and keep them evenly moist and fairly cool. Don't give them too high a temperature or you get a gaunt and leggy plant and that's not good at all. 
and then I leave them there for possibly, what, another six weeks? Until the flower buds are showing. That shows they want moving on again. They need more food. Lift them out. Marvellous how efficient a, an ordinary dinner fork is for separating plants. Root system good, right down to the base of the pot. Put them into a, a slightly stronger compost, Johninus number two. You're aiming at balanced growth all the time. Don't ever think by sticking a plant into a, a very, very strong compost that you're going to do it a favour. Because all you do is push it violently and you get an unbalance and it doesn't look right. Use a pair of scissors to just remove that flower bud. You can see there the reason why. A mass of young shoots coming from down below. Then, after a further week or two, that's what you finish up with. Instead of one single flower stem, you've got one, two, three, four, five, all about to burst into bloom. There's only one way of describing a mass display of cineraries like this, and that's spectacular. I don't know of any pot plant that gives you quite the vibrant contrast of colour that these do, provided you look after them correctly. They're easy-going plants, but get it a little bit wrong, and they do resent it. They object to hot, dry conditions. They object to being overwatered. And once a flower loses its luster like that and goes dead, and the foliage goes brown, there's nothing really you can do about it, except throw it on the compost heap. Provided you look after it, provided you get everything right, this is the result. Great canopy of flowers like that. Fine, healthy foliage. And that plant is being supported by a four-inch pot. It's not over-potted. If you give it too much room, then the whole of the compost isn't being used and parts of it get stagnant, and they get wet, and the roots die, and it wilts. And you can see there that that one is desperately searching for more nutriment. The roots are out of the bottom of the pot, and that's no real hardship. To make certain that you don't overwater, I leave about half an inch of space between the top of the pot and the compost. Let the compost get dry, and then fill that up to the pot rim with water, and then let it get dry again before you water again, and then fill it up again. And then because you are restricting the roots considerably, liquid feed every 10 days. Give the roots something to work with because they've got to support that great mass of flower. And provided you keep it in light, cool, airy conditions, provide you water and feed it correctly, that's the result, a great canopy of flowers. Hydrangeas in full bloom like this really are beautiful, but being shrubs, they have a habit of getting too big for the house. And when that happens, you can put the old plants out in the garden, but first take some cuttings. Now, you can go over your plants when they're at this stage and take any non-flowering shoots which show as cuttings. But I prefer to save a stock plant and to cut the shoots hard back when they finish flowering. Cut the stems back too four or five inches. You're going to force it into growth to produce a crop of young shoots which make ideal cuttings. And what I'm looking for are three pairs of leaves, if I can possibly get them, and a growing tip. That shoot there 
is just about right, but because the hormone concentration, unlike other plants, is fairly well diffused through the stem, you don't have to cut underneath a node. Cut between a node, and that gives you a piece of stem as anchor, because what I'm aiming for is to bury that leaf joint about half an inch in the compost. Take the lower leaves off with a sharp knife, and dip the shoot end in rooting powder. Everything that helps, I believe in using. Make a hole in the pot. Push it in just deep enough to bury that node half an inch. Now, all that rooting medium is is sand, soft sand. They seem to like a soft sand to root into, not a really sharp one. That one I cut underneath the node, because really, by using as many leaf joints as you can buried in the compost. You've got a better chance of rooting. And if the top leaves are rather big, cut them down by half. It stops transpiration because what you're doing is you're removing a shoot from the pen, you're cutting off all the moisture supply, and if you've got big leaves losing moisture, you've got more risk of the cutting dying without rooting. Push it well into the compost and firm it in. And there's room for one more. And that one there which is going to, with a little bit of luck, give me three plants. There I've got the one, two leaf pairs of leaves and the growing point with another pair of leaves just opening. Take the lower leaves off. Lovely strong cutting, that. Dip it in the rooting powder, knock off the surplus. And you've got to keep them moist, you've got to keep them humid, otherwise they dry up and die off. And you can either put them in a propagating frame, or you can put the whole pot inside a polythene bag. But if you put it inside a polythene bag, make sure the leaves aren't touching the sides of the polythene, otherwise they'll damp off. And you treat the cuttings exactly as you treat the parent plant. You keep them moist, you keep them humid. Because when a big hydrangea is in growth, and about to flower. You can't water it too much. I water them every day. And they take it up. They love this moisture. They seem to, to grow with increased vigor. And six weeks later, it's obvious that the cuttings have started to root. The tip is breaking away and growing. And the leaves have come away. Usually when a cutting doesn't root, except for the odd occasion, the leaves stay put and just shrivel. That's rooted. Goodness. That's rooted. Absolutely. There's a good solid root system through the sand. It's hungry. The leaves are going orange because there's nothing in the sand. So get it potted off. And I use a John Innes compost, but with no lime in. If you put lime in, you get pink hydrangeas. If you use an acid compost, in the main you get blue ones, unless you're growing a naturally pink variety. Make sure the young plant is well potted, of course, but the secret with hydrangeas is to keep them moist. They do need a tremendous amount of water when they're growing. Look after them properly and you should get magnificent blooms like these. Azaleas are one of those seasonal house plants that produce a mass of brightly colored flowers just when the gloom of winter seems to press us its heaviest. But they are expensive, so look after them. Keep them in cool, humid conditions. If you put them in a high temperature, then the flowers are quickly over and the foliage begins to scorch. Give them watered and fed. And then about the middle of May, put them out in the garden in a cool, shady place and mulch them in peat. And then you want to aim at keeping the first plant for as many years as possible, and each year take cuttings. And that way you finish up with a forest of azaleas. Absolutely beautiful. And when the last of the flowers on the azalea fade, keep it watered and keep it sprayed over and fed, because what you want to do is encourage the young side growths like this. Because they make perfect cuttings. Just absolutely right, that one. The ideal cutting, as far as I'm concerned, with an azalea is about that length, two and a half to three inches long, just firming at the base. You don't want it hard. It just wants to be firming while still soft at the top. And you trim the heel 
with a sharp knife so to get rid not to take the sliver of old wood away but just to clean it up like that take one of the lower leaves off and that's a good cutting and I'm very particular about the compost that I use for rooting azaleas. It's a mixture of two parts of peat and one of sand, and the sand must absolutely be lime-free. Any hint of lime in a compost for azaleas, and they get very unhappy indeed. Fill a pot up and just firm it lightly, briefly, and then dip the end of each cutting in the rooting powder, and dibble them in round the edge of a clay pot. I use a clay pot. They seem to be happier rooting in a clay container and make sure always with every cutting that you put in that there's no air space at the base it is vitally important that you don't hang the cutting and when you water azaleas remember that they don't like lime so use rainwater if you can possibly get it firm them in usual couple of taps to settle them down keep them moist keep them humid Ideally, if you haven't got a propagator, then inside a polythene bag after you've watered them and you create the micro-humid climate that they need to root in. And if you've given them the right conditions, they'll root in four or five weeks. If you can't, they'll be much slower, anything from eight to ten weeks. But if you get it right, eventually you'll finish up with something like this. Now, it's obvious that those two have rooted there. They're into growth. The first signs of rooting are when the growing point breaks and you get young leaves at the top. But I can't tell how well they're rooted until I knock them out. I'm not going to try and fork them out. I'm going to knock them out very gently. That one certainly is rooted. Not quite as well as I would have thought mine, because I have treasured them. Ah, that one's better. It's a little more optimistic. And this reluctant hero hasn't rooted at all. Now, that is quite extraordinary, because they were all taken at the same time. They were all taken from the same plant. They were all rooted in the same conditions. One's got a titchy root, one's got a bigger root, and one's got no root at all. But if you look there, the callus has formed. That means it's going to root. So I'm not throwing it away. I'm going to put it back into the compost with a sharp admonition to get on with the job. But those two are ready for potting off. And you do use a special compost. There's no way that you can get as early as to grow in the ordinary potting compost. And this one is known as the ericaceous mix, unless you want to mix your own, which is based on peat and lime-free sand. But you can buy it ready mixed, and it's got a little fertilizer added too. Now, immediately after potting, Keep them close and moist and humid. Azaleas love humid conditions. They root better, they grow a much stronger leaf, and you don't get any discoloration of the foliage. And particularly when you bring them into the house, when they're in flower, they much prefer to be in a cool room rather than a hot, sort of dry aired room which withers them up. That's the whole secret with azaleas. Create the conditions that you get in a woodland then they'll be happy and you should in 18 months time have some of those lovely flowers that are such a delight to look at. Christmas cherry, Salernum capsicastrum, really in the colour of the berries and the dark green of the foliage, express the festive season. But when you walk through a greenhouse and see a great mass of plants, what do you look for? Because if you choose the best, you're going to have something that'll give you colour for three or four months of the year. I had a plant last Christmas and eventually I planted it out in the garden in July and it was still a mass of berries. So you're going to get that sort of return if you choose correctly in the beginning. And what I look for is a good, short-jointed plant, a stocky plant that's clothed with foliage right down to the edge of the pot. Neat, 
well shaped, perfectly closed. And I don't want too many berries, bright orange at the beginning. I, I believe in getting value for money. And if you get a plant where all the berries are bright orange, you're not going to have the pleasure of watching them change from dark green to orange through all the transition period. What I don't want, something like this. Just a straight stem, no bushiness or anything, only four or five berries there waiting to develop. No, there's nothing I could do to turn that bad plant into a good one. I couldn't prune it, I couldn't feed it, I couldn't do anything to it because it's spoilt initially. Nor do I want something that looks like this. More like a standard apple tree than a Christmas cherry. There the foliage is gone from the base. That will never come back. The lower leaves are still turning yellow. It means they're going to drop. Instead of getting better, that plant is going to get worse because the stem will get barer and barer. So choose a plant. Make certain that you've got it as good as you can get it to begin with. And then, because the foliage tends to grow on occasions and hide the berries, you nip out the shoots like that. What you're doing is showing the berries off against the dark green background. The more you finger prune it within reason, the bushier, the better foliage you're going to get there. And the berries sit on it like a dark green cushion, the bright orange against the dark green. And they don't want high temperatures. They need a cool, equable temperature. And they last much longer that way. They don't need so much attention to watering. And when the plant is finished, the berries are over, you prune it hard back. And that makes it produce a mass of good cutting wood like that. And the compost that I put them into is two parts of sand, one part of peat. Another one, trim it. Take off any foliage that's going to be below the level of the compost. Dip it in rooting powder. Another one round the edge like that. And that one. You don't want a whole forest of Christmas cherries, so don't take any more than you need. And pop the pot and cuttings inside a polythene bag, but always when you put any cuttings inside a polythene bag, make sure the foliage doesn't touch the polythene. When they're rooted, they'll start into growth, and you pot them off, and you keep them growing on. And then the big problem with Christmas cherries is to get the berries to set. So I stand them out in a frame about the middle of May when all fear of frost has gone. That way they're open to the pollinating insect. When the weather is warm, I damp them over morning and evening because that helps the berries to set. And they grow on there, you get a superb set of berries. Bring them back into the house as soon as the weather turns cold in September. They're the same family as the tomato. So treat them as you treat your tomatoes, but don't eat the berries. They'll do you no good at all, so keep them out of reach of children. You may not be able to eat the berries, but they do make a bonny pot plant. Cacti and succulents are especially interesting. Many of them come from the desert regions of America, and the stems function instead of leaves. If they had leaves in the desert, of course, they'd dehydrate and die. And a lot of people start a collection with one plant because, well, you can neglect it. You don't have to be continually watering it. But that's not the best way to grow cacti. Once you see them in flower, once you realize what an infinite diversity of stems and shape there is, then you begin to want to pursue that interest to grow all the different species. But there's one bonus once you start a collection and they begin to flower. You've got the opportunity there of raising the plants from seed because they do set seed with a little encouragement. And if you look closely into the flower, that one there is not quite ready. It's just beginning to open because when the flower is ripe, the stigma comes up above the stamens. It protrudes above it, grows out from amongst them. 
And look at that flower there. There it's happened. The stamen are down below. The stigma is pushing up through them ripe. And with a little encouragement, taking a pair of tweezers, and pulling some stamens off another flower that are shedding pollen, and then very gently dust it over the sticky head of the stigma. Because both the pollen grain and the stigma are sticky receptive like that. You can make a noise like a bumblebee or a moth. I don't know whether that helps. But what you're doing is the work of the bee or the moth in transferring the pollen from one flower to another one. That pollen grain will germinate and grow down the style and fertilize the ovaries. And you come to the next stage and to me that's just as pretty as the flowers because the seed capsules themselves are bright scarlet. They're not quite portly enough to be ripe. I can pull one off, but I'm pretty certain that that'll still be juicy. Almost positively certain, yes. The sap dries up when the capsule is ripening. Now, this one, a different species, flowered about a month before the other one, and the seed pods, much fatter, much more portly. That's a fair indication. And if you look at the end of that one, the old stamens there are dead. So there's a fighting chance that'll have ripe seed in it. Still a little bit early, I think, because the juice is still running there. But there, the seeds there, look. The black seeds come out, but not quite ripe enough. There's a little one sitting on the palm of my hand. Not quite ripe enough to sow. Because cacti are creatures of the sun. There's no question about that. The seed must be full ripe. It germinates that much quicker. Now, if you haven't got your own plants, that's no deterrent to seed sowing. Because you can buy cactus seed in so many different species and varieties that you can actually build up a collection of cacti from bought in seed. It's a very fine mine. The temptation to open the box the wrong way. That's it. What do you get for your money? Very fine, very dust-like. So I saw it off a of paper. And the sewing medium, well, I find vermiculite is just the right stage of inertia and yet contains sufficient nutriment to boost the seedlings into growth. Sowing into compost is a problem. You tend to get it too wet, etc. whereas vermiculite will take up water to a degree until it's saturated, but the surplus drains away. There's no question of stagnation. And it doesn't grow algae and moss and all the other rubbish that the standard compost seems to do. So use vermiculite. Horticultural vermiculite. Don't nip along to the local building site and get some of theirs, because that tends on occasions to be very limey. And when you buy vermiculite, it, you buy it by bulk, not by weight, because it is very, very light. And then what I'm going to do with that is to take it and plunge it in a bowl of water, because I want the vermiculite evenly moist before I sow the seed. You can see the water coming up, just speckling the surface of the thing. It takes up water. It's very, very hydroscopic. Now, that is evenly moist. The moisture is right through. Every grain is super saturated. And that's the way that vermiculite drains. All the surplus gone within seconds of lifting it out of the container and yet leaving the main body that you're going to sow into. Absolutely saturated. Now, the exciting part, the sewing. And using the blade of your knife, Just get the paper like that. And if you start at one side of the compost and very gently, as the seed rolls down, tease it across the surface. No way that you can get it overcrowded there. Very gently. Tease it down over the surface of the compost. Time gardening is a thing of patience. Can be reflective. Not a seed wasted, not a seed in the wrong place. Even some bits of dust that might possibly be seeds have gone on there as well, because waste not, want not. 
and then cover it with a sheet of glass. It keeps them warm and it holds the moisture in and they will surely germinate, sometimes in three days, sometimes three weeks. In fact, these have taken three weeks to push up. And if you look closely there, the little specks of green, cradle stage cacti. And there you can see the affection that the roots have for the vermiculite. That thing is actually clinging on to that vermiculite as if it was its mother. And this means that when you move them from the compost, there's the minimum check to growth because they take a little vermiculite mother along with them and re-establish so much quicker. Not quite ready yet for pricking out. Drop him back in. He can get on with the business of growing there as nature intended. And then when they get to this stage, in about three, four months, there you can prick them out. They're big enough to handle, and I'm certain that they'll have this same affinity for the vermiculite. There, see? How it's clinging round the roots. They don't make a very big root system, but enough to support the plant. And now they're ready for transferring to the seed tray, and at this stage, I use a mixture of three parts of three millimeter grit and one part horticultural grit sand. Now there's no nutriment at all in that medium, so you've got to feed them and use a very, very dilute tomato liquid feed. That's enough to keep them going. Don't think you're going to boost bigger, faster growth by increasing the strength of the feed. They don't like it one little bit. They can take so much and no more. And Strange how useful a kitchen fork is. Because the cacti sits between the prongs and they come up with a good old load of vermiculite on them. Already, you know, at this seedling stage, they've got the individual character of mammillaria, complete with spines. So it's a good idea to handle them, not with your fingers, with a fork because they can be very affectionate even at this stage. And some cacti thorns have barbs on them and instead of working out of your fingers, they work in. That'll be a nasty experience. Space them out evenly over the tray. It's so much nicer when you finish the work when they look neat. And Tidy, and it has the additional advantage of giving each one a share of the space. And even in a seed tray, you'll find that individual seedlings within one particular species, some will grow faster than others. Because you can get, oh, six, seven, up to a dozen varieties in a seed tray, if you're growing a collection, make sure that you label each variety. Because some of them are very much alike until they flower. I maintain looking at that, looking down a trayful of different mammalaria, they're attractive even at this stage. And to my mind, the best way to display any plant is to put it in a garden context, and that includes cacti, because when you put it into a group like that, in a garden setting, you get the full beauty of the contrasting shapes and the contrasting colours. Now, you don't need any special container as long as there's sufficient depth to get first a layer of aquarium gravel in the bottom to provide the drainage, and then one or two pieces of lump charcoal just to make certain the mixture is sweet and doesn't get stagnant, because the one thing that cacti don't like is stagnant moisture. And then to stop the fine compost that you're putting on top, washing down and blocking the drainage, put in a layer of peat, just a thin layer of peat as a barrier. Choose the plants that you like, put them in such a position in the container that each one complements or contrasts the other. I like one or two taller ones in to lift the level up and then one or two of the more spreading cobwebby varieties to give you a ground pattern but always some of the golden-haired mammillaria that give you that change of season so exactly and flower when they're comparatively young. 
And then once the landscape is complete, dress the top of the compost with gravel. You want a proper background. It's all to do with garden design. You can make a very attractive little desert garden using cactus. And you've got the added advantage that unlike a garden of houseplants, you can go away and leave it for a week without any fear that they'll shrivel up and die on you. But don't get the idea because they're cacti, because they come from the desert, they don't need water. During the growing season, they need moisture. The compost needs keeping just moist. And if your compost is well made, any surplus moisture will drain away and the plants will be perfectly happy in there for several years. And you don't get a lot of problems with cacti, but there's one that inevitably, if you grow a lot of plants, you're going to get, and that is mealybug. You can smell them like broken biscuits when you go into a room, like mouldy biscuit. And all you do with those is to get a brush, a soft brush, and a bottle of methylated spirit, and wherever the colony is, just dab it like that, and dab it on the mealybug, because the mealybug have a waxy covering, and what the methylated spirit does is penetrate that and kill them. The alcohol kills them. It doesn't harm the cacti, but the mealybug certainly will, so get after them as soon as you see them. There are some plants that you can grow for years and never get tired of them, and the Christmas cactus is one that I must have grown 20 years, and I still like it. I think it's a most enjoyable plant. And the great beauty, this is the sort of thing that you'd buy if you went to a garden center. One plant in a pot. And the great beauty of them is that they flower when they're very small. You don't have to wait years for a plant to mature. And they flower over a long, long period. Some flowers full open like that, you get a massive display. And then you get other flowers, the buds opening over a period that gives you the continuity of display. It's not into flowering out within a matter of weeks. And they're very easy to grow. They don't need high temperatures. They need sunlight, yes, but not too much. Otherwise, the foliage tends to get discolored. So I keep it on a sunny windowsill during the winter. That brings the flowers out. And then during the summer, I stand it out in the frame and keep it watered and fed. And only two things, as far as I know, kill it, and that is being frozen. They don't like frost. They're a cactus, and they don't want to be frozen. And overwatering is the other. They'll take a lot of water in summer, provided your compost is well drained and the surplus is running away. In winter, I keep the compost just on the dry side, then give it a good soak and allow it to dry out so when you tickle the compost, it's dry on top. That is ready for watering now. But look at the quality of that plant. And not only are they easy to grow, they're easy to propagate as well. And one of the things about indoor gardening is immediately you get a plant that you enjoy, that you want to see more of. You want to make, instead of one, to have two. And they root very easily. All you do is pull the little stems off like that. But you need a plant that hasn't flowered. It's no use pulling those off, I find, because it's not really an active growth when it's flowering. Now this plant is in active growth because I've kept it in a cooler place. And that's the one to provide the cuttings. Don't spoil the shape of the plant. Choose cuttings from where they won't be seen. Crossing and overcrowded stems will do fine. There's a good one there. These are flattened stems and they pull away very easily. If you just take it like that, bend it up. But no sign of damage hardly, a little tiny mark. And that's your cutting. It's not too big. Get them too big, be greedy, and they tend to wither at the ends before they're rooted properly. Just about the right size. I might even get flowers from that the first year after rooting. It's one. There's another one in there. Down in growing across, it'll be hidden even if it does flower. Just pull it away there. You can see how it joins into the stem. And the third one. And that one isn't going to subscribe to anything. All the rest of the branches are growing over the edge of the pot. So. That one has a, a better hold on life than the other two. But a little persuasion, and there it is. And that's the sort of wound, at the very worst, that you get. It's not really a wound, and it calluses over very quickly. 
and those are the cuttings, and they're just like any other cutting, providing you realise that these are flattened stems, they're not leaves. And the compost that I use is loam based the John and a seed compost, but with extra sand added. It needs to be gritty, it needs to be free draining. You know, one thing you don't want with any cuttings is stagnant water. Keep it moist, the surplus water goes through, and then you get root formation very, very quickly. It's a lovely compost, that. Very gritty. And put the cuttings round the edge of a clay pot. I, I do like clay pots for cactus. I, I can adjust the watering better. I think the Clay being porous enables the plant roots as they form to breathe through the side of the pot. And I'm going to gain an immediate effect, so I'm going to put them round the edge of the pot, and the cutting has a natural curve. You can see how it arches over. And I'm going to encourage that by putting it in that way. So as it roots, it arches over the edge of the pot. I bury or almost bury one of the flattened pieces, like that. One into there. I never get tired of taking cuttings. It doesn't matter how many you take. There's still an excitement of thinking, well, my goodness, I've got one Christmas cactus. If all goes well, I'll soon have four. One big one, three little ones. They're settled in. All I've got to do now is give them the conditions for rooting the quickest possible way. Water it well and then keep that warm. Keep it moist. And then when they've rooted, I've got two options, really. I can either do what I did here and pot them up into a bigger pot, one, two, three cuttings, so that I get a big plant immediately. Something that looks enormous, something that when you think that every one of those flattened stems is going to produce a flower, you can imagine what a spectacle a big, mature plant of Christmas cactus is when it's in bloom. That plant has been watered, looked after. It needs copious watering during the summer. I give it a holiday in the frame, I keep it fed, and then you get the sheen of good health on the leaves. That's what, I mean, that is a foliage plant. Doesn't really matter if it flowers or not. It's got quality foliage, it looks healthy. And there's nothing more satisfying to a gardener than a healthy looking plant. Or I can pot them up individually and finish up over the course of years with a patriarch, something that looks like that. That plant must be, I should think, about 14 years old now. I can't remember exactly. It still gives me the same pleasure, the same delight, when it's flowering like that as it did when it flowered the first time as a cutting. Beautiful. You put that down in a room, and the eye is taken straight to it. It lights the room up by the quality and the colour of its flower. And this is one of the things you've got to remember with indoor gardening. You want something attractive, the setting must be right, the context must be right. You get the light through a window, through those flowers, translucent at a time of the year when you can't garden outdoors. And this is the great beauty of indoor gardening. It doesn't stop when the winter comes. It doesn't stop when the weather's unkind outside, when the snow a foot deep or the ground is frozen hard or it's throwing it down. You can turn in and get the same satisfaction from growing good plants indoors, from growing plants that flower like that indoors, as you get from the open garden in the summertime. Well, that's the end of the indoor garden videogram. I hope I've given you some idea of just how you can use plants in the home and how much pleasure and satisfaction you can get out of cultivating them. There are other videograms in the series on vegetables, on fruit, on flowers, and they're full of practical hints as well.